Hey, Pastor Eric Colser here. I hope that this sermon resource will bless you in addition to your participation in a local church. If you've been checking us out online and you're not a part of a church family, we'd love to meet you and get to know you in person. But again, we pray and hope that this blesses you and helps build you up to be sent out on Jesus' mission. Welcome. In case I haven't met you yet, my name is Eric Colser. I serve as uh, one of the pastors here at Gospel Collective Church. Uh, we're so glad that you're joining us for corporate worship. Uh, we are in the book of Luke, so if you have a Bible um, or a tablet or a phone, put it, uh, turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Uh, at the end of last year, we uh, opened up this book as it uh, introduced us not only to uh, uh, the announcement of Christ, but his birth and greater detail than uh, the other Gospels. Uh, we took a break uh, in between for a couple topical series, and uh, we're diving back in with the uh, miracles and the ministry and teachings of Jesus Christ. And uh, this morning we're going to be reading through verse 12 through 26 in Luke chapter 5, a uh, story of Jesus uh, cleansing a uh, leper and healing a paralytic. I reminded church staff and community group leaders of this a few weeks ago, but this morning's text is a good reminder for, the all, for all of us. Um, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. That will be a common theme throughout the miracles and ministry and teachings of Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Luke. That was his purpose and his followers of him, our purpose. And of course, I am included in that not only purpose, but that needed reminder. Uh, last week was uh, pretty crazy and, and busy, and uh, it was a lot of uh, kind of administrative organizational things. Um, and when it is busy with things outside of uh, uh, coffee meetings and discipleships and, and people, uh, specifically also with uh, uh, the lost, um, I really start missing that mission, and I need these reminders. Um, as important as those things are, we all need to be looking for gospel opportunities. And so read with me Luke chapter 5, starting off with verses 12 uh, through 16, um, as we first see Jesus interacting with a leper. Uh, God's word says this, while he was in one of the cities, there came, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him, Jesus charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded, for a proof to them. But now even more, the report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Again, there's going to be two stories in what we will be reading this morning. This first one is Jesus dealing with a man with leprosy. As we know and see in verse 12, this man with full, it says full of leprosy, which as you may know, uh, those who had such a disease were treated and viewed as unclean, needing, healed, and changed. And this man happened to know that only Jesus can do this. You got to imagine the true hopeless state that this man and those with leprosy had felt. And this man knew that my only hope is Jesus it's interesting that he doesn't use the word can in verse 12, but instead will. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And then verses 13 through 14, we see Jesus does. He touches him. He wasn't afraid to touch him like many would have been at that time. I love that. He says, 
I will be clean. And immediately, Jesus heals him from that leprosy. At least it's not my pulpit this time. I don't know if you guys remember that one day when that happened. Um, And so immediately, just like the demons that were casted out, this disease leaves him. Jesus tells this healed man to tell no one. Still, to a degree, protecting his identity, which I think we need to think about more, um, about the wisdom of that with certain things for us as Christians and even in our witness and, 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 and testimonies with others, as often as we have already read and will continue to read that with these miracles. And then he charges this new man with a new identity, as you see here in verse 13 through 14. Um, verse 14 to not only tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses had commanded, for a proof to them. It's interesting here, as Jesus charges this man to follow the law with some of this, and as a certain witness to certain people as well, a reminder for us that Jesus came to abolish certain parts, but also fulfill it. And again, the witness that he was, he says, don't tell anyone, but go to the priest. Do what now you can do and show as a witness that you have been changed. And then verses 15 through 16, although Jesus said, tell no one, it still spreads. (laughs) It doesn't matter what Jesus may have said and he had purpose for what he was saying. The word was still getting out. Another thing we can learn briefly here, we can do our best but God may have different plans. The difference is that Jesus knew that this would happen. There was principle behind him telling him not to tell anyone. But Jesus still ultimately knew and accepted it would still spread and get out. And then it concludes in verse 16. As great crowds started to gather to hear him more and more and want to be healed. And the next story that we're going to read on in is proof of this. Jesus still would prioritize withdrawing to desolate places, to quiet and alone places, and spend time with his heavenly father, who he later tells us how to pray and who to pray to. You call, you refer, you know, have this relationship with God as your heavenly father. Speak to him. Getting away from everything. The busyness of ministry, the crowds, but needing his one-on-one alone time with his heavenly father. Father. We read on in verses 17 through 26. Again, the other story and remaining text focusing on that timely mission reminder. We have a mission from Jesus, like him, to reach others. And so here is that mission reminder from the paralyzed man and his friends. First, as we read verses 17 through 19 that we need to be willing to do whatever it takes to bring people into the presence of Jesus. Read with me, verse 17 through 19. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him, talking about Jesus, to heal So he's having a little church service, almost for church people, as the Pharisees and teachers of the law are all there in this house. In verse 18, and behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd. Remember last story, the crowds were getting larger. Jesus would get away to pray with his heavenly father, spend that alone time. But this is one of those ministry moments large crowd, church service. It says, because of the crowd, had no way to bring him in. They went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. See, inside this room, they had a church service for church people, while outside there was a person in need of it, maybe more than anybody else in there. And so the friends of the man in need climbs up on a roof and lowers their friend through the roof. And it wasn't like there was like a secret entry. Like 
there was vandalism going on here, okay? I mean, they're taking the tiles up and lowering their paralyzed man so he can be in the presence of Jesus. Whatever it takes to bring our friend in the presence of the one who can heal. That, church, is an act of desperation. That despite the obstacles in the way for this paralyzed man to meet Jesus, everything from the large crowd to his disability to a building, which they took care of by vandalizing it and lowering their friend down. Despite the obstacles, they did whatever it took to bring him to Jesus. And when I re- read this, and I think about the same for us and within us, the great potential obstacles before us, I can't but help to think, are we like these friends who would be willing to take such risks, to be desperate enough to do, in certain sense, outside of sin itself, whatever it takes for people to be in the presence of Jesus? Or do we care too much about what others think? Not willing to take the risks to bring people to Jesus. In fact, you may be asking that. How come I'm not willing to do whatever it takes? Well, going back to the word that I mentioned, maybe you're not desperate enough. We do some pretty extreme, extraordinary things when we are desperate. It's often in our desperation where we are willing to take such risks and do whatever it takes. Dr. Caroline Leaf, who is a brain doctor, had said desperation does stuff in your brain that causes you to think, believe you can change. And remember, God is the one that created your brain in such ways. When you are desperate, you don't let fear get in the way of the risk. Often you don't second guess. Sometimes you don't even have time the second guess. And this mindset, the heart, the attitude, the spirit that does the change within this, it changes us from thinking not just we want to reach people for Jesus Christ, but into we have to, we have to reach people for Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9.16, For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And again, I can't but help to think. Do we have this mindset, this heart, this spirit of desperation to a degree to do whatever it takes for people to be in the presence of Jesus, especially now when we know and see people need it the most. I think of history. Certain examples that have stuck out for me over time of people willing to do whatever it takes for others to be in the presence of Jesus. Think about Martin Luther in 1517 who broke away from the church he loved to try to reform it. But knowing this needs to be revealed that there is false gospel teachings and we need to get the Bible that reveals the true gospel in every person's language and in every person's hands. And out of desperation, he reformed. He was looked upon as a good type of rebellion so that people can be in the presence of the true Jesus. Think about the testimony of John Leonard Dober and David Nitchman in the 1720s, two young adults that, when they were teenagers, felt called into ministry and missions, and specifically for a certain people group in the West Indies while they lived in Germany, which was more churched. And that in their young 20s, listen to this, you can Google search it, they sold themselves into slavery to travel 
to the West Indies slaves and share the gospel with them. You talk about risk and desperation for who they felt burdened for. You need to hear and be in the presence of this Jesus Christ. You know, I, I think about our own church. I think about our church in its very beginnings as we were a campus of Center Point Church and Pastor Tim Parsons, who was our lead pastor and a mentor of mine, were in 2005 having a very comfortable, thriving student ministry in Florida of nearly 1,000 teens and college students, but felt compelled and to plant a church in Lexington with very little money and resources to do so. And where everybody around him, as he had shared often before, told him, this is not smart. He knew God, out of desperation, taking the risk. People there, I feel called to, to be in the presence of Jesus. I think about our church in 2020. In the middle of a pandemic, a contentious political, cultural time where for the very first time in over a hundred years, Christians and churches all across the world did not meet in person for anywhere from weeks to months and all had to communicate all things with scattered social distance crowds over a recording. A desperate and faithful people believing we will do whatever it takes to keep Jesus' mission of making disciples in this city in central Kentucky with a stubborn endurance to be the church at this time and have a deep love for Jesus and each other. How it was a time where people would say, that's not wise to become an autonomous church, but out of desperation, out of call, taking the risk, and God bless in using it so that people can be in the presence of Jesus. I think about today, 2024, where statistically the world around us, people around us who yearn for community, who yearn for social interaction. I had read over this last month, I don't know where I was when this was announced, but a year ago, next month, it was a year where the Surgeon General in America announced loneliness in America is an epidemic. Like, do you know what an epidemic is? Do you even know what a Surgeon General is? Because I kind of didn't. Like, all I associated them was like the cigarette packs that would be like Surgeon General warning, you know, this contains carbon monoxide, do not smoke pregnant women. And I would always be like, pregnant women? This is like all people? You said you have carbon monoxide in this thing, okay? They're like the health doctor of America, okay? Like the guru of disease. And for them to say an epidemic, which means in a short amount of time, some type of disease has spread so far and so wide, and to use and say, not talking about like influenza or COVID, but loneliness is an epidemic in America. And guess what? I, as a pastor, agree. I think now more than any time I've lived, hearing the testimonies of college students, student ministry, and beyond. Lots of factors could play into that. But in the end, I believe people are lonely. And God has graciously gifted us a church that values and prioritizes relationships, community, intentional discipleship relationships. We have an answer for an epidemic. Are we desperate enough to take the risk to show and share that? You know how often I hear from others how jealous they are of the community and fellowship displayed, how amazed that a church that values families and ministers to kids the way we do, that has college students that want to be with adults and loves to be in fellowship with them outside of their age group. 
and how in so many ways those start leading to the questions and answers that Jesus Christ is the solution. And just like we read here, it spreads. And we can't just wait like before for a new kids building or parking or for certain people to come back just like we couldn't wait until COVID passed. We must obey God's command to make disciples right now. Church, can you imagine if Christians in other countries said, I'll just wait until the communist government is overthrown before we meet and share. I'll just wait until it becomes legal. Like, what if the disciples said that? This is no different. Look for the opportunities that God will give to invite, to share, for people to be in the presence of Jesus. Are you desperate enough? Will you be willing to do whatever it takes? Look as we read on. Verses 20 through 24. How God will use unconventional ways to help people respond to the gospel. It's not all on us. We just do our best, take the risks, have that mindset heart for people to be in the presence. But God is the one that does the saving. And he will use unconventional ways to help people respond to it. Read with me verses 20 through 24. And when he, talking about Jesus, saw their faith, the friends of the paralyzed man, that they were willing to vandalize the building, to get these people, this person, in the presence of Jesus, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? First thing that happens when, G when the friends lower down this man, he doesn't even take care of the physical healing immediately. But knowing their faith and knowing he has the power, authority to save and forgive sins, he goes directly to the spiritual part. And the first thing that the church people around, scribes and Pharisees, begin to question, who is this who speaks in such ways? This blasphemy that has the authority to forgive sins, but only God alone can do that. Verse 22, when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, why do you question in your hearts? In fact, verse 23, which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven you or to say rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. A couple things with this. First off, as we know and as we read right here, the gospel message is always needed. That does not change. Even with these friends with intentions and motives, the best I could read, and from the other gospels that shares this other same story, they were going for a physical healing, and Jesus addresses the spiritual, and that should never, ever change. Hearing the gospel is always needed. Forgiveness of sins. People don't just come to know Christ without it. Romans 10, 13 through 15 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And so we read and know there has to be an actual verbal proclamation, sharing of the gospel when we are willing to do whatever it takes for those to be in the presence of it that it may not be through our ways or methods that we're used to. With the paralytic, he wasn't even coming to Jesus. Again, best I could read to hear the gospel, let alone receive it. He has a physical need that needs fixed. And all of a sudden, Jesus is saying stuff like, son, your sins are forgiven. 
And others around him are thinking, he's not even talking about the sins. Like, the guy just needs to be physically healed. And who are you to have authority over such things? But he addresses the spiritual. And he uses even what could be differing motives in this way. And we see in Scripture how God uses everything from messed up sinful people so that others can be in the presence of Jesus. We see God use people's wrong motives. We see God use dreams and, and visions Again, getting them to a place where a verbal proclamation of the gospel. And we know, again, he can use what seems to be the most unlikely of circumstances so that others can know, see, experience, desire, and receive the Jesus Christ that we know and love. We cannot be afraid to get a little dirty when getting into others' lives. It's okay to be in uncomfortable places for the purpose of the gospel and the mission. I was reminded of this heavily from this weekend. Um, I was asked uh, uh, months before to share... um, to speak at a teenage kind of D now retreat uh, in, in Illinois this weekend. And to be completely honest, when first asked, and the, the pastor had told me, uh, you don't have to answer right now, just pray about it, talk to your spouse about it, we'd love to have you. And I immediately thought, even before going to Jessica, I don't really need to do this because it just was a busy month. Just retreats and just uh, last week away for a wedding, it was like, just don't need to do this. But when giving me more information about it, he had mentioned that uh, two-thirds of their student ministry came from unchurched homes. And that was part of the reason why he asked me specifically to, to, to speak there. Um, knowing that, uh, praying about it, talking to my spouse about it, I, I went. And it was unique, you guys. Just that alone, to hear two-thirds of a youth group is coming from unchurched homes in Illinois. But... Also, when coming there and coming to realize that it wasn't a large church, but one-fourth of their congregation is those teenagers. Okay? You can do the math a little bit of the uniqueness of that and within that. And the stories we heard and testimonies of some of those professing Christians and teens. A teenage guy that had a dad that committed suicide. Another teenage guy with a dad who was alcoholic and abusive. A brother and sister taken from parents from social services. A girl who had tried to take her life before. A girl with a sister who was arrested by the FBI after they first arrested her parents, thinking it was them and what they were investigating, but then having to come back and finding out it was the adult sister. To a girl who a year ago had visited the church identifying as a guy, as a, as a man before becoming a Christian, and now that twin brother visiting that church, which, by the way, that twin brother hit on my oldest daughter right before we left as well. Just crazy stories from these teens confirmed by the pastor that these are not big fish pastor tales or stories but that these teens had said, we are so thankful in the midst of these horrible hard circumstances, we have found a church family and a Jesus to speak into these things. My my oldest daughter even had shared with me, being amazed by this with this, like, Dad, I've heard your testimony, what happened like, you know, 20, 30 years ago. I hear that kind of from others. But I'm around teens all day that are going through some of these type of things, but then go to the wrong source to try to fix or don't want to talk about those things. And she even said she was in awe and amazed 
that there was those who went through these things that said, I have Jesus. He is good. He is faithful. I endure because of this. And listen, church, do you think that's easy for the rest of the church? One fourth from such environments. Do you think it's easy for that pastor with his homeschool kids to be around the mess? Do you not know the sacrifices that they make? The unconventional things and ways that they have to fix things and budget things and have to be around things in order for them to have that type of testimony and opportunity and witness. Church, are you willing to make the sacrifices? Are we willing to go, no matter how hard it may be, how messy it may be, how unconventional things may seem, so that people will be in the presence of Jesus and respond to the gospel. Last of all, we read in verses 25 through 26, we will tell others about Jesus in response of the life chains from Jesus. And some of you guys, maybe it's because that seems so long ago and you have forgotten how he has truly changed your life. Some of you guys, again, there may be sin in the way. Some may be apathy. I don't know what it is. All I know, we read this over and over in the scriptures, and we see this in the story right here. We will tell others. We will be willing to make the sacrifices. We will be willing and desperate enough in response of the life change from Jesus. Read with me verses 25 through 26. And immediately, this former paralyzed man, he rose up before them, And picked up what he had been lying on. And he went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all. And they glorified God. And were filled with awe. Saying we have seen extraordinary things today. Read the other two gospel accounts of these last two scripture verses. The life change that happened that caused others to glorify God. Mark 2, 12, and he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Matthew 9, 7 through 8, and he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. Church, I've said this before. I'll say it again. I got an even more recent illustration for it. You share what you love. You will tell others about what you're most passionate about. And when something has, quote unquote, changed your life and you love it, you will share it with anyone and everyone. When you experience life change, you see life change, you share others with others about it for example uk basketball whether you love it or you hate it but let's be honest majority of you love it and so you evangelize for it y'all getting on board with the new pope of uk basketball you did some pretty great evangelism and even apologetics dare i say to see yourselves with him And you convinced others to get on board as well, including myself. You UK evangelist passionate about UK basketball sold me on him. The history and tradition reclaimed. Duke and North Carolina hired from within and it worked. Your lives have been changed to an extent because of UK basketball and you will recruit others to get on board. You will defend it and apologetically share it. Because if your life, you love something, you're so passionate about it, feels like it's been changed by it, you can't but help tell others about it. I was once a one and done lover, 
but now I'm a traditionalist that's going to bring back the glory days. I was once this, but now I'm this. How much more should we want to share about the life change of Jesus? Those who are discouraged, who wants to give up in trials and in deep despair, do you not know the life change of Jesus that can bring joy and contentment? Where I once lacked faith, I saw the miraculous God change through faith. Where I once had disdain for God or anger toward and now I have a loving father who will never ever give me up. Where I once was apathetic, over familiar, I am in awe and amazement. People told everybody about Jesus as we read here after they met him and after he changed them where they saw that life change. And if you are not telling people about Jesus anymore? Is it because God has stopped changing lives or that you have changed toward God? Even right now, circumstances has made it harder, but opportunities are still there. We just have better excuses. And again, did God change his life changing ways or did you change toward God? Did he stop healing people, bringing joy? Or did you stop believing and replace that joy with apathy? With whatever it is. And listen, church, I witnessed it this weekend. People are still amazed at a changed life for Jesus. And whether you got saved at six or over the last few years, your lives have been changed. I pray that this week's community group discussions will go down in the history of this church, whether it be accountability or motivation for mission, that others will hear the life change of Jesus because we said, we want to share it. We're desperate enough for it. We're willing to go outside of the box. We want what we have for others. He's still in the business of changing lives. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you, Lord, for those friends that cared enough for their, their, their friend in need go on top of that roof to break in and that when Jesus saw their faith in the need he saved that man both physically but most important spiritually and that man couldn't but help to share that with others may us be Lord that man with the changed lives and those friends to do whatever it takes certain strain and finances, certain sacrifices with relationships, going against comfort and convenience so that others who need you, Jesus, can experience that life change. I thank you for still doing that over all this time, despite the obstacles, despite the hardships. And I pray, Lord, that we will unite in that. That you fill us up and send us out. And I pray for anyone in here that may not know you. But Lord, they are hearing of that life change that only comes from the gospel. They do recognize they don't know you because of the sin that stands in the way we were born with and that we choose. But God, out of your great love for us, you died on the cross. For those sins, you took our sins upon yourself after you proved who you were through what we're reading in Luke, that you truly are God on earth, perfect, 
loving and caring, building up to that time you took our sins. And you did not stand in the grave. You rose from the dead, defeating sin, Satan, and death. And anyone in here, whether they've grown up in church or this is a little bit new to them, that recognizes they are a sinner still in need of a Savior. That they turn from their sin and have saving faith in you. And that you are going to change their lives forever. When in their heart of hearts they cry that out right now. God, I pray for those in our lives that need that. You can fill us up, send us out. May conversations and community groups and discipleships go toward this. Make us desperate for the people that you love. Father, we thank you, Lord. We pray this in your name, Jesus.